All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Steve Weinberg, who is in Chicago. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing wonderful today. Great. And Steve has spent his life selling and helping others sell better, more and faster. He recently led the Acuity sales team to new sales accomplishments for 12 years. And um, Steve has over three decades of leadership experience in sales. And you have just written or just published, and it's available right now, is the book Above Quota Performance. Um, okay, so Steve, I mean, let's get straight into it. Uh, what I was like when somebody's written a new book, I was like to get the genesis of the book. Like, what what prompted the book, and um, why did you decide to to write it and and publish it at this time? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, what prompted the book was that I decided to retire from active sales, and I thought mm -hmm. that since I was very very successful in sales and sales management. And I used a lot of very non-traditional ideas that I thought I could pass that on to other people to help them become more successful. I used what I called Steveisms. When I trained people, I would give them this sheet of paper that had bullets on it and explain each of the items to them. There were about 12 or 15 of them. So that when I wrote the book, I expanded on the Steveisms and I explained each one in detail in a chapter. And I can give you some examples of that if you'd like. Yeah, yeah, another fantastic if you could. Yeah, that would be great to get some examples. One of the Steveisms is to welcome objections, not fight them. When most salespeople go through a sales training class, and I went through about a dozen, uh, we spend a day or two learning how to handle objections, how to, how to, what to say. If they say this, you say that. If they bring this mm -hmm. up, you bring that up. And I call that objection jujitsu. And rather than try to neutralize objections, my idea or my proposal is to welcome objections because objections are really information on why someone doesn't want to buy from you. So if you're trying to sell somebody, what is more valuable than getting information on why they're not buying? So my idea is really yeah. to seek objections. If they don't bring them up, then you should bring them up. Uh, for example, say, why wouldn't you buy? Uh, what's in your mind? What's stopping you? And and get yeah. that information. And rather than arguing with them about it, listen to them, try to understand where they're coming from, and then prepare a strategy to resolve that issue with them. Yeah, because as you as you know um, as you know only too well, Steve, is that if you try to go around, you know, just trying to avoid objections or you know make sure that none of, none of nothing like that comes up it's going to come up but it's probably going to come up later in the sales cycle and kind of take you a little bit off guard because you have not addressed those things up from you haven't welcomed them in the way you talked about you've kind of pushed away and and gone with the strategy of hope they don't come up and sometimes people can be really insulting to the buyer when they get an objection like the buyer might say well, we don't like the color you have, or we don't like the price. And then the salesperson gets indignant and says, what do you mean you don't like it? And that that's, puts the the uh, buyer in a very defensive mode, and it's not, it's not a good way to build trust with them. But you're correct that an objection never goes away. It stays there. And sometimes, and I use the example in my book, sometimes it kind of festers it's like cancer. It comes back at the end, and then, you know, if you don't address it early on, it, it becomes pretty powerful at the end, and it could knock out a sale. Yeah. Um, the other thing I noticed you you mentioned here about is identifying buyer roles, uh, and and I do think that that is somewhere where today some people struggle with, right? Because I mean, as you know, B sales is complex. There's a lot of different people who can be involved in the buying process, and they all have different roles, etc. And really identifying them can help you. But if you don't, if you if you approach everybody kind of in the same way, you're lost. That's correct. I mean, it's essential to, to understand that. And one of the other original ideas that I put in this book is that there are a, a, a lot of really, really good sales books that have been on the market for the last five or 10 years. There's some really good ones that came out in the last few years. And, and many of them go through the sales cycle from the sales point of view, where, you know, this is what you should do the first step, the second step and third step. 
but none of them look at it from the buyer's point of view, what they're going through, educate the salespeople to understand what, what the buyer is looking at and what, what's important to them. And as you mentioned, the roles, it's important to understand the roles and to identify who the executive sponsor or the economic buyer is. Uh, many times I had salespeople come to me and say, I can't understand why they're not buying. And this is a really good solution for them. They have the budget, they have the need, they're motivated, but they're not buying. And I would say, well, have you met the executive sponsor? Do you know who it is? And they would look at me with, with a blank stare and they'd say, no, I have not met her. I don't know who that is. If, if you don't get there, buy it. You're not going to, in many cases, for sure, in the, B2B, in the B2B world today, you're not going to close the sale. No, absolutely. And I think the, the other part of that too, Steve, is something you also mentioned in your book, is about understanding the buying process. Um, because that's right. basic. I mean, we often focus on the selling process, but the buying process, that's even more, obviously, is critical. Right. And the, and the selling process is more of a step-by-step -step process. The buying process is really almost a random, nonlinear process. It, it, bounces, mm. it bounces around to me like... Uh, uh, like a ball in the, uh, I'm trying to think of the games that you play where you pull the thing and it, and it just bounces around. It just goes and oh, pinball. it's very unpredictable. Sorry? Pinball. That's right. Pinball machines. Yeah, it was, it was escaping me. But that's kind of like the, the uh, buying process. It's just, it's very unpredictable. And I mm. believe that sales has become far more complex in the last few years, and especially even more so with the pandemic than it ever has been before, certainly more so than when I first went into sales in the 1970s. Yeah, I, I would I would actually I would completely agree with you. And I think it's funny because it's running again, it's running against there was a lot of people even pre pandemic who were starting to go. Oh, you know, with AI and with all these things, you know, the role of the right. salesperson is going to be diminished and, you know, they're just going to be in the background. But, but the reality, I think, as you mentioned, is it's become more and more complex all the time. And the demands of people and what they want and the human connection and the empathy and all of this stuff is you're not going to be able to do that with AI. And you need salespeople to be even more kind of even more um skilled in their craft than ever, especially in complex sales. The, yes, the salesperson needs to be much more adaptable and much more agile, and, and they need to understand that the needs of the prospect are far more important than anything that uh, they've been told before. It's, it's, and, and they also have much more limited time, or I should say less time, with the prospect now than they ever had before. The, the buyer will not give you the, the access or the the amount of time that we the quantity of time that we were used to in the past. Mm -hmm. And they're far more educated. And, and, they've, done, they've done a lot of research before and, you go there. Yeah. And I love that point there about the time factor because you're so that, that's so spot on about the fact that is they they are going to give you far less time. And and part of it is, you know, people are very busy. But they're also very, very distracted. And there's so many things coming from everywhere to them that if you're not careful, you can just get lost in the noise. And that's, I think that's one of the hardest things for salespeople to overcome today is getting lost in the noise. Absolutely true. It's, uh, it's hard to get mind share from them. Uh, as I mentioned, they're far more educated. In the past, salespeople could go in and sit down with them, explain uh, or listen to what their problem is, explain how they could possibly help them and spend a lot of time with them, just what I call solutioning. Today, you know, it's not unusual for them to say, okay, you've got 20 minutes to, to meet with us and that's it. And uh, it's awful hard to find out what their needs are and how to match up their needs with your solution in 20 minutes. So to to your point, then part of it becomes a part of it becomes a a negotiation of getting the time that you need and the incremental negotiation of getting more contact, bringing more people in. So it's not it's it's almost an ongoing negotiation to get the time and attention to really consider what you have to offer. I agree with you. In fact, uh, if someone didn't give me adequate time, I told them I was wasting my time meeting with them because. At that point, they would, 
they would buy from whatever they thought the prettiest brochure was or uh, how <laughs> nice the person was because they really haven't taken the time to research what, what each one does and differentiate them. Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, Steve, is is this whole thing about leads and generating leads and lead qualification. Because again, we've gone through this very strange period in sales, especially when the whole inbound thing came uh, came into vogue. And suddenly it seemed to convince a lot of people that, oh, yes, if you do inbound properly, you can just sit back and wait for the leads to come in. You don't have to prospect. You don't have to do all of those things, which we know is complete nonsense. Of course you do. Uh, but tell me a little bit more about um, from your perspective about generating and qualifying leads? Well, I've, I've never worked in, a, in an environment where the salesperson had enough leads to uh, to reach the quota that they have, to reach their sales quota. So that being the case, it's on the salesperson to generate their own leads and even more so to generate qualified leads because uh, spending time on unqualified leads is really the biggest waste of time and maybe the the largest reason why why many people don't reach their sales quota because Mm -hmm. they've invested too much time on the wrong prospects. So it's it's more important to for salespeople to target the right prospects for the product or solution that they have and find the right people in that company and, and do a very, very hard qualification before they invest a lot of time. And one of the things that you also mentioned is using using LinkedIn for business development. And what I like about what you're saying there is using it for business development, not using it for spamming people, right? And unfortunately, today you see LinkedIn is used by a lot of people that just it it's not prospecting, it's just spamming, and it's not business development. It's just spamming you and hope for, hoping for the best. Um, how do you advise people to uh, how to approach LinkedIn from a business development perspective? I, I think LinkedIn is really an underutilized sales development tool. Uh, most people are very familiar with it, uh, using it for uh, the career development. But to give you an idea of, of how I used it, and, and by the way, I used LinkedIn to uncover a, a new person at a target company. And over a period of about 18 months, I worked with that person and closed the largest sale in the company's history by a multiple of eight. Mm-hmm. So it was several millions of dollars. But to go back to how I did it, uh, I had a list of targeted companies. And in LinkedIn, you can follow the company so that when they publish news, uh, it's almost like getting a news feed from them. Mm-hmm. And then you can also uh, look at the targeted titles of people in the company. So for example, if you're selling a financial solution, you want to look at the CFO, the chief accounting officer, the treasurer, the accounting manager, all the titles of people in those areas at that company. And then you can, as well, you can also, you can follow those people. What I would do is look, I would join company, I would join groups in LinkedIn and then Usually the groups were related to the business that I was in. And then I would look Mm -hmm. at people and see if they were in those same groups. If they were in those groups, then I would approach them and I would invite them to connect with me. And I, and it's, it's always, you always want to explain to somebody why you want to connect with them because just sending out a standard, I, you know, I want to connect with you, click here is not good enough anymore. People receive too many of them. So I would say, you know, dear Mary, uh, we're both in the, let's say, the SAP user group, and I'd like to discuss how we could possibly, uh, if, if you have any ideas or I have any ideas, we could exchange ideas as how we could help each other out. And that's how I would ask them to connect with me. Then once they would connect mm-hmm. with me, I would, I would send them articles or I would try to uh, build a relationship with them over time that, so they could see me as a, a value-added person to them. And then at some point, I would ask them if they were the person responsible for purchasing the solution that I'm selling. And even if they were not, that was okay. Because if they came back and said, no, that's not me, that's someone else, I would say, well, can you introduce me to that person? And mm-hmm. I would say my rate of success in that was at least 90%. 
So they would wow. then say, you know, uh, Jane does this. And I'd say, okay, can you introduce me to Jane? They said, sure. So then I would contact Jane. I would say, Marion, you know, referred me to you. I understand you're the person that's responsible for this for decisions on this particular area. And they would usually say, yes, I am. And I'd say, well, can we set up a call to discuss how we, we could possibly help you? And that's mm-hmm. the way I kind of worked my way into the company using LinkedIn. And then, yeah. you know, LinkedIn a- works into works on the principle of the uh, of networking so that once you mm-hmm. have a few people in a company, you can build on that network over over a period of time. Exactly. Very large. And I think what you outlined there, Steve, and what I really want people to take away from this about what you just said now is the fact is that what you've outlined is a process, right? It's not an overnight thing because the thing that frustrates me the most, I'll tell you right. the truth, is when somebody reaches out to me on LinkedIn and they write this lovely personalized note. Um, oh, you know, your experience, blah, blah, blah. We're same interest, share, just like you outlined there, right? And then I go, okay, and I connect. And immediately I get that automated email um, from, you know, in email or whatever it is in LinkedIn with them trying right. to pitch me something. And I'm like, what's the point? You, you pretended you wanted to connect with me because of these shared interests, but really you just wanted to tell me something. And, and that's what I think is people are so impatient. They don't want to build relationships. They don't want to add value. They don't want to do all of that thing. And then what you get is you'll get a couple of those emails in a row. And then they'll say, well, if you're not interested, just let me know. And I go, yeah, well, the fact that I haven't replied to you since the first connection should give you a pretty good indication of that. <laughs> right. You don't ever be considered spam. And, and, I, and I agree with you. If you immediately, after connecting with someone, uh, go into a pitch, uh, I consider that spam. And when, yeah. when I receive those, I, I just delete them. I mean, I have no yeah. interest in, even if there's something I really need, I don't, I don't respond to it because it bothers me yeah. uh yeah. so you know i just view it very negatively but but again today buyers will buy from people that they trust so it's important yeah. to build trust it used to be they would buy from people they like now they'll buy from people they don't like if they trust them it's much more important <laughs> to build the trust and by building <laughs> by providing them with information that's useful to them even if it has nothing to do with your product, that's a, that's an excellent way to build trust. Yeah, the, no, I, I agree completely, and you're right. I mean, I think trust trust is such an important part because people are feeling so so burnt right now, and I think just um, and their antennas are, are are really up in a big way. Um, before we finish, uh, Steve, is there one other item from your book you'd just like to highlight? I'm sorry, is there one other item that I would like to highlight? It, it, yeah, yeah. One other item from your book that you'd oh, like okay. to add. I, 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 okay. uh, I think, well, there, there are a lot of things in the book that I hope people will find, find value with. Uh, one of them is I ask people to find what the real why is, the W-H-Y. What is the real why? When mm-hmm. salespeople came to me and said, you know, uh, this company, they're not, I can't get any phone calls back or they're not responding to me or my emails or whatever. I'd say, well, why are they even talking to you? And they would, a lot of times I get a blank stare. So if, if the salesperson doesn't understand the real why, why, what's motivating them to even consider you? It, it's really a, a bad signal. And it would, it would be, to me, an alert that the salesperson has really done an inadequate job of understanding their needs. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Well, listen, Steve, this has been great. And just for everybody, the book is called Above Quota Performance, Tips and Techniques of Becoming a Master Sales Pro. And literally fresh off the presses, literally October. I mean, it's out early. It's October 18th is the actual date, but it's available now. I started receiving phone calls from people on Friday telling me that it it arrived. So I'm very happy about that. It uh, came out a little bit earlier than it was promised. Yeah. Well, all of Steve's anybody... information is going to be below, below this video, but please do tell people a little bit more about you and the book uh, before we go, Steve. Okay, well, I, I, I hope that people will find the book useful. Uh, I think it's very original. I think there's information. My, you know, I also, uh, part of the reason why I wrote this is I saw a lot of people that didn't do well in sales 
and and I saw the consequences of what happened. And a lot of mm-hmm. the consequences were very negative, and and some of them were very drastic. Uh, marriages were lost, people lost homes, they, uh, and in in some cases even suicides. So I'm hoping to help right. people become more successful than they have been in the past. And if that happens, I, I'll feel a whole lot better about having written it. Yeah, that's fantastic. What a great that that, that that's a great uh, cause to have. And I think uh, yeah, yeah, you, you're correct. And I think. Uh, Great advice like the one that you're giving in the book is going to help people tremendously because we need we need salespeople to be successful because they are the conduits of of uh, trade and and um, bringing people together. It's a wonderful job if if it's done in the right way. And I think books like yours can only help to uh, not just improve the reputation, but as you say, like improve the the way people execute the job and then more enjoyable for them, more enjoyable for whoever they interact with on the customer side. So listen, thanks again, Steve. Thank you for watching and listening. And we'll see you all again. Thank you for having me, John. Of course. Thank you.